me uh, first uh, thank the gravitational wave, uh, the Nicholas and Lee Begovich Gravitational Wave Center for Physics and Astronomy for uh, hosting us and the Physics Club for uh, providing pizza and their time slots during the week to uh, to welcome here uh, Rana Ezzedine. So uh, Rana is an astrophysicist who's currently a professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Um, she did her master's, joint master's in astrophysics at Notre Dame University and the Université de Saint Joseph in Lebanon, and her PhD from the University of Montpellier in France. And she was a um, joint institute for uh, nuclear astrophysics fellow and a uh, Heising Simons Fellow at MIT before uh, she joined the faculty at Florida. So if I missed any key events. <laughs> so we're very, uh, very excited to have Rana joining us here uh, today. And uh, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm excited to be talking to you today about uh, some of my research and take you with me on a journey to uncover a treasure trove of cosmic clues. And I would just like to say that uh, I'm going to try to go kind of slowly to make sure that the talk is uh, approachable for everybody. But if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to, to ask. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. And so, yeah, um, let me first of all, maybe, maybe smaller. So, yeah, um, I'm. Oh, no, this is not you just. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm a stellar astrophysicist and in the title of my talk, you also saw uh, the word galactic archeology. span And that might be a word that maybe is not familiar to, to many of you. So let me take you on a small journey to tell you what galactic archeology span really is. But what we really do or what I do as an astrophysicist is I study stardust. So I collect the stardust from the universe and I use it to try to understand how the universe build up the, the, the cosmic blocks of life which is all the chemical elements that make up every everything around us in life. So really, I'm kind of like um, an Indiana Jones of the galaxy. And here, just to kind of take you on the journey, <laughs> but to show you how we use galactic archaeology to kind of trace back the elements to their origins. And so just to kind of give you, as I said, a brief introduction of what archaeology really is, you might be familiar by archaeologists or paleontologists. It's really the study of... Uh, oldest artifacts that we usually find uh, underground. And really, this is interesting because as humans, we love making things, right? We love making uh, artifacts, we love making little weapons, we might like making different things that we find underground, and this is what archaeologists eventually dig up. Uh, but also as humans, uh, we, we end up, our fate usually is we die. And, but that's, it's sad, right? It is sad. <laughs> But it's, it's interesting because when, when we die, we really leave all of these artifacts that we made and then uh, future generations can come and study all of these artifacts and they can learn about the history of Earth throughout this and the history of civilizations. And galactic archaeology is pretty much the same, but instead of studying artifacts that are coming from humans, we study what stars make. And stars also make things, but instead of making artifacts, they really like to make chemical elements. So actually, all of the chemical elements that uh, make up the universe that you see in the periodic table, all the way from, uh, from uh, lithium uh, to carbon, all the way to uranium, are either made inside the stars or via the stars when stars die at the end of their lives. I'm going to talk more about this. And similar to, to life of, of humans, uh, stars also die. And so when they die, they leave us all of this really rich kind of trove of chemical elements. And as a stellar archaeologist, what I do is I study the chemical elements that stars have left in the universe. And I use them as clues to understand the cosmic events that have produced them along the way. And so this is really the, the, the kind of um, the analogy that I like to make between archaeology and galactic archaeology. But no worries if you don't really understand exactly what that means, because I'm going to dive more into this throughout my talk. But one thing that I would like to focus on and highlight here is that in galactic archaeology, just like in archaeology here on Earth, we need to find objects that are old. And this is really key. So we cannot do archaeology with things that are new, right? So if I take this chair and I try to bring it back 
back all the way to its ancestors, it's going to be really hard, right? There's been a lot of production going on since there. Same thing with stars. If I want to understand how stars can be used for archaeology, I need to find those pristine stars that have been formed a long time ago that inside of them preserve the very unique different collective events that have happened in the universe. And I'm going to show you how we locate those stars and find them in the Milky Way galaxy and how we use them to understand the origin of elements. But let me first of all introduce to you what uh, galactic archaeologist tools are. Uh, we usually use the telescopes because stars give us their light, and this is the only thing that we can analyze. Unfortunately, I cannot bring it to a, a star and dissect it on my lab. <laughs> that would be cool. But we really use the, the telescopes, which provide us this probe into some of the faintest objects in, in the Milky Way galaxy, which is really good because most of the stars that we study are very faint and they are very far away in the Milky Way. They are actually, most of them are found in the Milky Way halo. So I don't know if you're familiar with that term. The galaxy is usually the disk, right? We have these spiral arms, and then it's surrounded by a halo. And most of the old stars that we study are found in these galactic halos. And I'm showing here some of the telescopes that I've used in my research right now at UF. I have uh, at the University of Florida, I have access to one of the largest telescopes in the world. It's a 10.4 meter uh, telescope. The mirror alone is 10.4. You can see here the scale. This is a tiny car. So it's really huge. It's really awesome because it allows us to look really, really deep more than any of the ground-based telescopes. Sometimes we also need to use space telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope. And I'm gonna highlight to you an example of where in my research I've used this telescope to probe the origin of the elements. Okay, but before that, so when now I've introduced my tools, so what does my data look like, right? Or in other words, we can ask this question, what do aliens see when they look at us, right? So we are a star, and when we're observing stars, we're looking at aliens maybe, or their world surrounding us. So what is the light that aliens look at that's emitted by our star or when we look at stars look like. They look like rainbows, right? So we, we study solar rainbows. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. And you can see that on this rainbow, which is what light is made of, there are some dark patches here. Does anybody know or anybody has thoughts about what these dark patches are? What do you think? Yes. Um, signatures of chemical elements. Yes. So where does that come from? Why do we see these signatures there? Okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Uh, I'm kind of breaching, uh, trying to remember, but uh, the, those are the specific things, of the, like the wavelength of light that corresponds to that specific element. Very good, very good, both of you. Very good answers. Exactly. So inside stars are made up of chemical elements that either they produced them or they came from previous generations. And luckily, they leave a print on these rainbows that we study, or as we call them, stellar spectra. And each one of these star patches corresponds to a specific transition coming from a specific element. And so by staring at these rainbows for so many years of my life, I can tell you, for example, that over here we have hydrogen, over here in the red, we have magnesium. Over here, we have calcium. So we can know exactly the imprint of these elements due to quantum mechanics and specific energies of each transition coming from every element. But what I really look like, I'm cheating here by showing you that I look at pretty rainbows. And by the way, this is the rainbow of the sun. This is the spectrum of the sun. What I really look like is look something like this. So we break this down into two dimensions where we have the light coming from the star. And so this is what we call the continuum. Them, and then each of these transitions usually show us the dip that is coming from the specific element. And then what we do is that we look at these lines or all of these dips or transition absorption lines and we use them to understand or measure the amount of elements that are found. So we study the abundance of elements. And so the abundance usually means how much of magnesium or iron or specific element does a star have, and we use that to probe the galactic archaeology or the origin of the stars. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about these stars and what do they allow us to really learn when we study them. So uh, in astronomy, we tend to cheat time, which is really awesome, because we get to look farther and deeper into the universe. And this allows us to look back in time because time, you know, light takes time to travel throughout the universe. And normally, different types of telescopes or different types of wavelength regimes allow us to probe farther away or a different toward a different what we call a redshift in the universe. So what you're looking at here, this is the Big Bang here, we assume it at really high redshift. And so they depending on how big the telescope is or on the wavelengths that it that it actually probes, it allows us to look farther away in time. And so you can see that ground based telescopes, they allow us to look to a certain redshift, but not all the way back to the beginning right after the Big Bang. If we go toward, for example, um, the the infrared, like the James Webb telescope, which was launched in 2021, this is one of the coolest telescopes that is out there in space now because it probes the universe in the infrared and it allows us to look all the way back to almost to the beginning of the universe. Now, remember I said in galactic archaeology, we're interested in old objects. So ideally, I want to try to look all the way back here to the very first stars, because these were the stars that made up the first elements in the universe. Now, the question is, can any of these telescopes probe all the way to the first stars? The answer, unfortunately, is not. Even James Webb, James Webb Telescope, it can probe very, very far away in time, but it cannot look at individual first stars. It's going to be able to look at maybe the first generation of galaxies, but not the first generation of stars. So using telescopes directly to probe all the way back there, it's not going to be possible. So we have to find another way to do it. And so let me tell you a little bit how we do this with stars. And so here I'm going to take you on what I call a chemical evolution trip. So all the way from the Big Bang, or right after the start of the universe, the Big Bang generated uh, only two elements, right? So only two elements were born with the Big Bang, and that was hydrogen and helium. And all of the universe was only made from these two elements. However, at the end of the life of these, uh, the first stars that were formed from these elements, so after they went supernova or they exploded, they ejected the elements that were made inside of these stars into the, what we call the interstellar medium. And the next generation of stars, so new stars were formed from that gas that was made from hydrogen and helium and everything that was made inside the stars, these second generation of stars were born from that gas. And so they have these really unique imprints. There wasn't a lot of these elements. There was only a little bit of magnesium, a little bit of iron, a little bit of everything. And this journey of explosions of the generations of stars continued on and on throughout the cosmic timeline. And so basically, if we are looking at stars that are born today or born recently, like our sun, which was only born 4.5 billion years ago, that's really recent on a cosmic timeline, it means that the chemical elements that the stars are made of today are much more than what was made of in the beginning of the universe, right? And so what that tells us is that old stars should not have a lot of elements in them, right? Because the universe did not have time to make up these elements. Whereas stars that are born today, like our sun, should have a lot of these elements in them, should have a lot of magnesium, a lot of iron, just because the universe has had a lot of time to recycle all of these elements, right? And so, yeah, this is where the sun is today. So if we probe that on kind of an axis that tells us how much elements there is, old stars had very few elements, rich stars had a lot. And I'm kind of highlighting this because it's important in a minute, and I'll show you how. Now, again, if I'm interested in the old stars, remember I'm in archaeology, we're interested in old objects, I want to try to find stars that were born here right after the Big Bang, not the first stars, because we said we cannot find these, but maybe stars that were born right after the first stars exploded and basically ejected the chemical elements into the interstellar medium, and they hold the keys or the clues to everything we can understand about the first stars. So now the question is, okay, we've identified our stars of interest. How do we find them? I mean, the Milky Way is 
has so many stars, right? Looking at the night sky, there are so many stars. How exactly do I identify the stars that are interesting, that are so unique and old and could only hold a few elements in them? Luckily, uh, stars that are old or second generation of stars have a special imprint on their atmospheres that we can study by measuring their chemical compositions. So just to remind you, stars are made of 73% hydrogen, 23% helium, which leaves how much for everything else? 2%, right? So all the rest of the chemical elements in the periodic table make up 2% of the content of stars. So us astronomers took the liberty to get rid of everything in the periodic table and call them metals, right? So everything that's not hydrogen and helium, we call them metal. Now, to remind you, as I said earlier, stars that are old should not have a lot of metals in them, right? Because the universe did not have time to produce that. So we call them metal poor. Whereas stars that are young, like our sun that had time to produce a lot of elements, we call them metal rich. So in order to identify the stars that were interested in galactic archeology, span we need to find stars that are metal poor. So we measure how much metals they have in them, which means how many elements or how much elements they have in them. And the less elements they have, the less metals they have, the better, which means that they're older, okay? Now, the question that you must be asking is, okay, do you find these stars in the galaxy? And do we have stars that are this old? Let's see. Um, so far, they are rare, there's not a lot of them, but so far, we've been able to identify about eight stars that we call pristine stars. They are pristine because we are sure that they came from a second generation type of stars. And the reason we know this is by looking at this ratio here, which is iron to hydrogen. So iron usually is a proxy to how much metals a star has, because iron is easy to measure in stars. And so if a star has iron to hydrogen, and that's relative to the sun, by the way. So if it's zero, it means that it has almost as much iron as the sun. So if a star has iron to hydrogen of zero, this means that this is a star that's almost as old as the sun, right? And so you can see that it has all of these absorption lines, which tells us that it's probably a young star. But the older the star is, the less metals it has in it. And so here we're going down in terms of metallicity. This is what this term is. You can see that stars around minus 3.2 of iron over hydrogen, which means that it's a thousand, it has a thousand times less metals than the sun. We barely see any absorption lines anymore, which tells us that this star won't have a lot of elements in it. And we can even identify stars that are about 100,000 times less metal poor or more metal poor than the sun. And you can see that it barely has anything in it. We look at the rainbow or the spectrum and we barely see any elements. And we've been able to identify some stars like this, luckily, that we know are very old and they remained or the, the reason they're still alive today is because they are low mass. Stars that are low mass live much longer than stars that are high mass. And so they managed to survive all of the cosmic journey and we're able to identify them and study them. And so I'm lucky to be, have been able to identify some of you or been part of groups that have identified these stars. And we give them funny names here. You can see that if a star has a metallicity between minus four and minus five, we call it ultra metal four. If it's between minus five or less than minus five, we call it hyper metal poor, mega metal poor, ridiculously metal poor. <laughs> Don't worry, we've not been able to identify any ridiculous metal poor yet, but that would be really cool because it will tell us that we probably have identified a first star, like one of the first stars. The question is, can we actually do that? Okay, so now that I've kind of laid the land of what we really use to study galactic archaeology and our tools are these metal poor stars, I'm going to take you through a journey of some of the results from the research of how we've used them to probe different understanding of the chemical elements and what they produce and also by extension, what we really understand about the chemical enrichment of the Milky Way galaxy. So I'm going to start by talking to you a little bit about 
about the explosions of the very first stars and our understanding of the origin of the chemical element zinc. Now, zinc might not be a very interesting element for you. Maybe you've seen it in the periodic table. It's like, yeah, whatever. It's another element. But let me make it exciting for you and tell you why it's interesting. But before that, why am I, why am I interested in the explosions of the first stars? So we still have a lot of open questions about the first stars that occupied our universe. And as I showed you earlier, no telescope can yet look at them just because it's so far away. We're looking really back in time. But another thing that we really know about first stars is that they all ended up their lives. So they all ended up with explosions. And there are so many different types of explosions with which they could have died. The most common is what we call a core collapse spherical supernova, where a star at the end of its life would just simply, you know, collapse on itself. And normally it would either produce a neutron star or a black hole. This kind of explosion is common because we understand it and we know exactly what kind of light curve and we've been able to observe it in some galaxies. However, there are some other exotic supernovae that might be more rare, but actually more interesting, such as a magnetar jet-like supernova, where instead of the star just collapsing on itself, it is spinning very, very fast. It has a large magnetic field. And so when it collapses, it produces jets that you can see will eject matter away from it. Another type of explosion is called a pair instability supernova, where we really don't understand much about it. It's still very much a black box. We know that the star simply collapses on itself. It might not even produce anything, not even an explosion. The star just disappears, but it produces a bunch of elements that we can find signatures of in the Milky Way. So there's a lot of questions about how these first stars explode. What is really the main way that they explode? And so, this, this is very important because early on in the universe, these explosions were the ones that gave us the first feedback into the universe. They gave so much energy, which changed the dynamic of the universe itself. It changed how the subsequent stars formed. It changed how the enrichment took place. It changed how the galaxies formed. And so understanding the explosions of the first stars is actually really important. Um, so what I'm going to show you here, and this is relevant, is how we believe the first stars actually formed. And I'm going to show you a small simulation of how they do in a Milky Way-like galaxy, so in a galaxy like ours. <laughs> so what you're seeing here is simply a gravitational experiment. We put gravity and we let it play its role. So we start here by looking at these little uh, red, what we call mini halos, and we believe that most of the first stars formed in these mini halos. And in yellow, you can see the very first galaxies kind of forming together. So eventually, every single mini halo due to gravity is going to collapse and form a Milky Way-like structure here in the middle. And that's really interesting because it tells us that every single mini halo indicates an environment for which the first stars formed in, right? And so if we can study that, we can understand how the interaction happened and how the first galaxies actually formed. So what do we learn? What do we know about these first stars that formed the Milky Halos? From cosmological simulations, like I showed you, remember, there are no observations. So only from cosmological simulations, People over the years have been studying the mass of these large stars and they found, or these first stars, and they found that the masses range all the way from like one solar mass all the way to a thousand solar masses. And that's different because every cosmological simulation is really different in terms of the physics, in terms of the interactions that they do. So there's no consensus of what the masses of these first stars really were. And why do we care about mass? Because if we know how massive a star is, we know how it's going to explode. We know the type of explosion it can do. So what if we can do that backwards? What, what if we can do galactic archeology span to constrain the masses and the explosions of the first stars? So let me tell you how we do that. 
the way what we, as I said, what we really study in galactic archaeology is the chemical composition of stocks. And here I'm showing you an example of the chemical compositions of two very old stars, one of those hyper metal poor stars. And you can see here on the x axis is C, which is the atomic number. So, for example, this is iron over here in 26, you have carbon, you have all of these elements in both of them. The triangles or the arrows are upper limits, which means that we don't have measurements, but we have some kind of constraint. In black, you can see here a model of a first star explosion at a certain mass and a certain energy that we try to fit to the observations, which means that we assume that the chemical compositions of these stars came from the explosion of one first star that once was in the universe. And then we can model this explosion and try to fit it to our observations. And based on that, we can go backwards and build up what we call the IMF or the initial mass function of the first stars. And so we do that. And you can see here a histogram showing how these masses differ for a range of number for 20. This is 21, pardon me, very old stars. You can see that doing this exercise leads us to some kind of progenitor mass that's ranging from about 10 solar masses to about 30 solar masses, which means that the first stars were quite massive, kind of like expected or how it was um, suggested in the simulations, but not as massive. It's not a thousand solar masses. That's kind of crazy. Maybe we have not been able to identify that, but at least we can put some kind of constraint on the range of mass. But also, we can put a constraint on the energy, not only on the mass itself, but on the energy of the explosion by which these first stars died. And so you can see that a lot of them died with fairly faint explosions, not very, not very energetic, while some of them were all the way up to 10, uh, 10 to the 1051 erg, which means that this is what we call a hypernova. So some of the stars might have exploded with hypernova. Now, why I'm bringing this up is because there are both pros and cons to using this method. The pros is that we can use direct observational insight to understand the first stars or study the first stars by studying the composition of a second generation star. However, some of this method has cons as well. And I wanted to bring this to your attention is because you can see, for example, by looking at this star, all of these are arrows, which means they are not measurements. So measuring the compositions of these stars, especially for these heavy elements between 25 and 30, is kind of difficult. And this is some research that I did, particularly to try to understand the element zinc. And you can see here, zinc has a Z of 30. So we don't really have a measurement in either of these stars for the element zinc. But why is zinc interesting? Because when we study the zinc ratio relative to iron in the universe as a function of iron, so this is usually looking back in time. As we're going to a lower iron abundances, we're going back in time. You can see that zinc is kind of increasing. So there must be an event in the universe that produces zinc abundantly, especially early on in time. So my question was, where is zinc coming from? Why is this element so high? We don't expect to see so much zinc in the universe. And so I went to study particularly this star. It doesn't have a fancy name. It's just a phone number, HE1327, which is basically its coordinates. But you can see where it is. It's right over there at the edge, which means it's one of the oldest stars that we have identified. The cool thing about this star is it's a hypometal star. It has been very well studied before, but there was no measurement whatsoever in zinc. In it. So I attempted to try to measure zinc by getting a Hubble Space Telescope measurement of this element. And you can see here, this is the spectrum that we looked at. It was a very, very kind of small, tiny line, but we were able to <laughs> squeezed it out of the star. And when we did this measurement, interestingly, we found that it has a lot of zinc, which is in line of what we saw over here. We, it had a zinc over iron ratio of 0 0.8, which confirmed that there was a lot of zinc produced early on in the universe. Then we went on to answer the question, so where did this zinc come from? What kind of explosion would lead to this amount of zinc in the stars? 
So typically, this is again the observations of our star, HE 1327. We try to fit it early on with a normal spherical supernova or a core collapse supernova. You can see that it fits most of the elements, but it certainly does not fit our zinc measurement, right? So there must be a different type of supernova that produced this element or maybe all of the other elements in this star. So we went ahead and tried to fit it with a jet-like supernova. Remember that supernova that brings out a lot of jets from it. And interestingly, we were able to produce much better, not only zinc, but also titanium, which both are explosive elements. And what explosive element means is not that it explodes by itself. It means that it is produced during the supernova explosion of the star. And so this allowed us to put a constraint that maybe in the early universe, these types of explosions, the jet-like supernovae, were actually very common, that they produced a lot of the elements that make up, especially in, in, the, in the very heavy element regime. And this has a lot of implications because, as I said, it tells us that maybe the first stars exploded with aspherical or jet-like supernova, but also it has other implications of how the chemical enrichment took place in the universe. So let's think about it that way. If a star is exploded with a normal spherical core collapse supernova, all of the elements will be ejected almost the same in all directions, right? But if we had a jet-like supernova, what would happen is that the elements would be extracted from the core of the star outwards along these jets. And so that means the material will actually reach farther out in the universe than where a normal supernova would actually reach out with these elements. Now, that's really interesting because do you remember the simulation that I showed you about the mini halos all forming uh, stars together? What if the explosion of a star that happened in one of those mini halos can actually eject the material all the way to a neighboring mini halo, which tells us that there might be two channels of star formation early on in the universe, one which is an internal enrichment, so if a star ended up ending its life with a spherical supernova, that means the material won't leave the mini halo, the star, the elements will be right in the same material. However, if we had a jet-like supernova, the elements could all the way get to a neighboring mini halo and could enrich an external pardon me, mini halo and form this, the next generation of stars there. And this was actually probed by multiple studies that were doing these types of simulations. You can see here that they confirmed that it is very likely early on in the universe that the stars or the very first generation of stars were actually formed by externally enriched mini halos and not necessarily internally ones. And so by studying this only single element in an old star, we were able not only to answer the question of where zinc came from or how, why do we have so much zinc in the early universe, but also we were able to answer a question of how the early formation of the galaxy came to be, which is really interesting. So I'm gonna stop here for a minute and see if you have any question about this before I go on to my next topic. Yes, or 10, 10 minutes. minutes. Okay, that's 10 minutes to- 2.45 after. 2.45, okay. All right, oh, yes. Quick question, why does the zinc uh, disappear over time? Why does the abundance decrease over time? Oh yeah, that's a good question because just to note that we are here comparing zinc to iron. Okay. So it's not like zinc disappears, but iron becomes more prominent. And iron is usually produced in type 1a supernovae. So that's usually a white dwarf with another star. And so this tells us that the type of explosions that formed zinc early on in the universe probably was more prevalent in the early universe than in the later universe. Thank you. Okay, so since I don't have a lot of more time, I really want to tell you about another area that I am very excited to work on that is probably more related to the gravitational wave that you do here. And that is our understanding of the R process or the origin of the heavy element. So again, I'm going to tell you how we use galactic archaeology to understand the origin of the heavy elements. So just to remind you what the R process is, uh, as you know, and as I mentioned earlier, all of the elements beyond lithium are formed either inside the stars or toward the end of the lives of the stars. 
Uh, particularly the R process or the rapid neutron capture process is a process that happens in an environment that requires an explosive conditions. So usually we will have a seed nucleus like iron and it gets bombarded by a lot of neutrons and then it gets bigger and bigger. It beta decays and forms all of these heavy elements that you see here in the periodic table. So elements like gold and silver and uranium, all of these are formed during the R process. But up until 2017, which is fairly recent, we did not know where all of these elements came from. In fact, we had some indications, but we were not exclusively or been able to say this is where the R process actually takes place in the universe. And let me tell you why. So by simulations, or what I'm going to show you here, is what we call a chart of nuclei. Has anybody seen this before? Yes, <laughs> Jocelyn. Okay, so there's a lot going on here, but let me just kind of point you toward the important things that I want you to look at. And it's a simulation, so it'll start in a minute. So on the y-axis here, you have Z, which is the, the number of protons, and N is the number of neutrons. So this is a simulation of what kind of elements are formed during a neutron star merger. So that is when two neutron stars form together. And the reason I'm talking about a neutron star merger, because it was assumed that maybe our process actually forms during that. Until 2017, we had no clue, right? But we'd assume that this is where the R process takes place. So look at the time here right after the merger and see how the elements are actually formed. And so this is starting from zero all the way to uranium. So I'm gonna play the simulation. And within a couple of seconds, you will see that the R process simulation shoots up. So that's all of the nuclei forming. And then as they beta decay, so that is converting protons, uh, pardon me, neutrons into protons, you can see that they all scale back and go into what we call this uh, valley of stability. So all of the stable elements or stable nuclei that we see in the periodic table, this is where they usually lie. And this is all of the elements that I showed you earlier in blue in the periodic table. And so we had a simulation that showed that indeed during a neutron star mergers, all of these elements could form. But of course, it took GW170817, which is the gravitational wave event that was truly spectacular. And for me, it's one of my favorite cosmic events that happened, I'm sure some of you as well, when LIGO and Virgo first detected a binary neutron star merger due to gravitational wave uh, indication. But at least for me, what was more interesting is the uh, the the thing that came after the gravitational wave, and that is the electromagnetic counterpart, which is what we call a kilonova. So every single telescope in the world was pointed toward this event. And what we saw is the following. And we saw basically a red kilonova and a blue kilonova, which lasted for different days. So the blue lasted for a couple of days. The red, we could see the light kind of decay for a longer time. And we know that this kilonova is actually fired up or the fuel behind it is the radioactive decay of about 10 to the minus two solar masses of our process elements. So this was a direct kind of confirmation that while we had suspected that neutron star mergers could actually produce our process elements, we were able to see it for the first time in this event. Um, and again, you know, this is a different simulation showing you how this could be produced. So here you are looking as a function of temperature, of when the neutron star merger happened. And again, the disk, which is where the merger of the two stars takes place, is believed where most of the ejecta would come from. But of course, I'll leave that to Jocelyn <laughs> to confirm this uh, even more. Uh, but the question is, so is all of the R process coming from this event, or could there be a different event in the universe, like maybe an exotic supernova that could form more of these R process elements. So we still have a lot of open questions in place. Interestingly, during the event itself, pardon me, we were able to detect the element strontium in the spectrum of the kilonova itself, which is a neutron capture element that actually further confirmed to us that there was freshly produced R process elements in the, in the uh, neutron star merger. 
But we still have a lot of more questions because not all of them could come from neutron star mergers. Some of them could actually come from like dying low mass stars of different types of supernovae. So the goal is to try to answer exactly how much of the R process is formed during a neutron star merger. Now, from a stellar point of view or a stellar archaeology point of view, um, what we observe is that when we look at the compositions or the abundances of the heavy elements, the R process elements in stars, and you can see them here in the red dot as compared to the solar system, so how much our sun has of these heavy elements, you can see that they all match pretty well, right? So this is not a uh, match the dots kind of exercise. This is actually how much they match together which tells us one thing, that whatever produced the heavy elements in our sun, in our solar system, so all the gold that we have here on Earth must have been produced by a unique event or a similar event to what we see in the old stars. And that gets us interesting because it means we can study the old stars that have a composition or a high composition of these R process elements to trace it back to the different types of events that happened you know, billions of years ago. And this is exactly what I do. So I am part of a collaboration called the R Process Alliance, which is as cool as it sounds. <laughs> we are on a quest <laughs> to use observations of the oldest stars in the galaxy that have a high concentration of R Process elements in them. And I'll show you an example here for one of them. So between these are two stars and these are their spectra. Can you tell me which one of them has the R Process elements in them? or is enhanced in our process? What do you think? HE. Sorry? Um, it's OK. Yeah, you're right. HE. HE 1523. So the reason we can tell that, because all of these elements, remember the, does anybody know any of these elements? <laughs> it's OK if you can't know them. So this is europium. It's one of the prominent R process elements. We also have samarium, lanthanum, et cetera. So these are the names that we never learn at the bottom <laughs> of the periodic table. But these are all R process elements. And we find a lot of stars that have these signatures. And we've been studying them to try to trace back the origin of the R process, but also to trace back how the neutron star mergers actually take place. For example, do all the neutron stars have the same mass? Do they all merge the same way? Do they have different spins? So we can go from observations all the way back to try to understand exactly how the event went by comparing our observations or abundances to the models of these different types of events. And so I just wanted to show you here quickly that we've been able to study about 600 of these stars with about a thousand more to come over the summer. So we've been able to really build up a knowledge and just to kind of show you that before 2015 or before 2017, people were not very interested in these stars. They would flag them as particular stars and just put them on the side. But since then, we've been building up a knowledge and understanding and interest in these types of stars. Uh, since I don't have a lot of more time, I just want to finish up with this thing. One other cool thing about the R process is that it forms one of my favorite elements, and it's, it's the element uranium. Now, uranium is a very infamous element, and I can understand why. It's had its bad rep here on Earth, <laughs> you know, but in the universe, it actually is kind of cool. The reason it's cool is because it has a very long half-life. It has a half-life of about 4.5 billion years. And that's really interesting because if, for example, there was a neutral star merger somewhere in the universe a long time ago that was able to produce the element uranium, and this element uranium then got enriched, so it went out into injected into the interstellar medium, and a new star was formed with this element. And if we can happen to actually observe this star after a while, so what is going to happen is because it's radioactive, it's going to decay. And today, with our telescope, we are studying this star, right? So if we have an idea of how much uranium was produced initially, so an initial production of uranium, and we measure the uranium today, we can actually measure the age of the star, right? But not only the age of the star, we can actually measure when the neutron star merger took place, right? So we can age the event itself and place and aging things is really cool and fun, but it's really important too, right? Because it allows us to kind of trace back how the events took place in the galaxy. 
And this is one of the research that I'm doing uh, with my, oh, sorry about that, with my student at the University of Florida, Shivani Shah. We were able to identify uranium in a couple of stars. And by the way, there's only five stars to date that have uranium identified in them. And the reason is because uranium is a really difficult element to identify. So I'm showing you here a spectral line where uranium is. And you can see it's this teeny tiny dip, right? And it lies in kind of the wing of one of the another line, which is iron. And so there was only a single line that people have used for decades. But due to that, not a lot of uranium stars have been identified. So Shivani was able to identify new uranium lines in the spectra, and you can see them here. We can observe them at two different resolutions. So even at the lower resolution, we can still see the uranium. And so by the way, the blue is lack of uranium. So if we remove uranium, you will see this is where the continuum would be. The red means that we actually have uranium in there. You had a question? Oh, no. no it's just a OK. <laughs> Um, so that's really interesting. So she used this technique and what we call nucleocosmochronometry that I explained to you earlier to measure the ages of four stars. And you can see that it's really cool because this means that we were able to study stars that are about 12 to 14 billion years. Now I know what you're thinking, 14 billion years can be right. That's a little bit before the Big Bang. <laughs> And you are right. However, we still have large error bars on these measurements. Uh, the goal for us right now is to try to bring down these error bars and to kind of constrain the ages better. And it takes the input of a lot of um, nuclear astrophysics because the production ratio is still a bit unknown. But we're very close to be able to place an age on a large number of stars using this method. And now we're applying it for about 50 stars. So soon we're going to be able to measure the ages of about 50 stars using this thing. Um, I think I'm going to stop here today uh, for now. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about chemical abundances, but I want to leave ample time for questions. So just to wrap up, uh, I'm hoping that by this talk, you were able to take away that uh, old stars are really cool uh, tools. Uh, I use them, I like to use them as fossils to trace back and understand the Milky Way galaxy. And as I showed you that if we use them to trace back the origins of the elements such as zinc and the R process and the heavy elements, we can better understand the formation history of our galaxy, but particularly we can also use them to trace back the events, all the explosive events that took place about 14 billion years ago. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions.